The Legacy of Wisdom Project gathers and publishes answers to many of humanity's most pressing questions from some of our most experienced and profound leaders. I'd like to turn this over to John Borosenko and thank you very much for coming today. I know you have a lot of snow, so... <laughs> I live up in Gold Hill. It is snowing. We've had ground blizzards and had to get our driveway cloud out to come. It's amazing. 25 minutes away and it's another world. So I want to tell you two stories because I think wisdom speaks through story. Uh, it's, the, it's the way that our, t our souls really get touched more than through information. And I've learned that if there's a story and if it's very real to me, it becomes a transmission. <clears throat> and then information can hook on to what's already there because the soul is engaged. It knows the truth through story. This is a story that some of you who know me have heard before. But it's the story upon which I think um, the road of my life took its, took its course. When I was 10 years old, I became seriously mentally ill with obsessive compulsive disorder, which had psychotic features. In fact, I was completely psychotic. It started with dreams, uh, and they were scary dreams, shamanic dreams. And they were dreams of being in the jungle, and there were headhunters with blow guns, and there were scorpions, and there were snakes. And I became obsessed with this, and I started to imagine it during the daytime. And then I began to imagine that these, I was the only one who could see these jungle things, just, just about to manifest in this world. I could see them in the between world. And the only way to stop them from manifesting would be to do a series of rituals. So that's the compulsions. So I was obsessed with the, the story, and then I had to do compulsions, rituals, um, to stop the manifestation. And it was things like, now it turns out I'll probably never have Alzheimer's because I spent six months reading upside down and backwards. It turns out that's extremely good for your brain. And I would have to finish any reading three times, and if I was interrupted, I would go into complete terror because I would think now my parents and brother would be killed. Then there were the typical kinds of rituals, like hand washing. Then there was a ritual of I could not speak until I had imagined the entire sentence, word by word, and it had to be centered, like you would on a computer, one thing under another. So I spoke very slowly and very rarely. And this, of course, affected my ability to go to school. I got sent home permanently from school for a bit. The day that I showed up at the nurse's office with red streaks up my arm and said, take me to the hospital because I've been hit by a poison dart. That was the beginning of my understanding the mind-body effect. <laughs> that you imagine something is true in your body and darned if it doesn't happen. And so this went on for quite some time, living in, I cannot begin to tell you the terror in which I lived, a continuous state of terror. And one day, I, I sat down to pray. And I only thought of this, actually, because I went to a Jewish camp. Uh, I've been two years at a wonderful Jewish camp. My parents were both atheists, although my father was a bit of a nature mystic. And what, what happened, I wanted desperately to go back to that camp because there was something there that was real to me. Um, some transmission of wisdom that came through the stories, that came through the song, that came from the silence of nature, that came from the beauty of the lake, that came through the elder, Hadassah Blocker, who was the director of that camp. So I sat and I said, maybe if I pray, and I didn't know what to pray for. But I think you taught me this, Zalman, later. The best prayer is help. <laughs> so, that 
That's what I prayed for. And I had this moment of cosmic consciousness. I certainly had no context or word for it. But once you've lived in a state of total terror, to be in a state of absolute peace, love, and connection with something much larger, which was the heart of wisdom itself, is an amazing experience. And I knew in that place, first of all, the peace and the love was so overpowered, and there are really no words whatsoever to describe it. But from that place, I had a knowing. And the knowing was that I could recover from the mental illness, and I knew exactly how to do it. So I had a little download. This was my 10-year-old poem. Somewhere in the darkest night, there always shines a little light. This light up in the heavens shines to help our God watch over us. And when a small child is born, the light, her soul does adorn. So when our only human eyes look up in the lightless skies, we must know, even though we cannot see, that this light burns far into the night to help our God watch over us. And that poem held the sense of peace and love and possibility for me. And what I thought was, well, gee, if every time I need to do a ritual, I do this instead. I sort of substituted a higher order ritual <laughs> for the other things. I can recover. But I knew that I could recover. And within three days, all the nightmares stopped. All the hallucinations stopped. All the need for doing rituals stopped. And that formed the rest of my life. Because as I got older, the kinds of questions I was able to formulate about that experience matured and grew. I became interested in what is the neural basis of that kind of wisdom, uh, where you have that internal knowing. What's the psychological basis of that kind of wisdom? And what is the actual experience itself of touching that place of wisdom where fear is totally replaced by a sense of love and where this world of practicality, this world of survival, joins a world that is eternal, a world where everything you ever needed is there at your doorstep. And so I've devoted my life, actually, to exploring that wisdom. My husband, Gordon DeVeron, and I decided to, to do a book about it, which is called Your Soul's Compass. And the subtitle is What is Spiritual Guidance? Because that's one word for wisdom. And Zalman was one of the people that we interviewed for that. I just have to say, this is a line I often say from what you said, because the big question, of course, when you touch another place is, have you just touched something in yourself? Is it part of your history, your desire nature, your ego? Or is it really coming from another place? So trying to discern the difference between your ego and actual wisdom and guidance is a very important thing. So we asked that question of Zalman. And your answer, which you may or may not remember, is, if you could tell me that, Joan and Gordy, I will become your disciple. 